Thanks so much. I'd really like to thank the organizers, Thomas, Alexander, Yong, and others for putting this together. It's uh, um, quite uh, excited to be able to share today. So I'll, I'll be speaking a little bit on um, the history of applied topology, which was a pretty popular area of research even before machine learning uh, sort of um, changed our field. And I'd like to describe uh, today some of my perspectives on, on how machine learning has has changed our field and, and will continue to do so. Um, let me say, I'm, I'm also quite interested in online research activities and um, help direct AATRN, which is the Applied Algebraic Topology Research Network. So we have about one or two live talks per week. We record the vast majority of them and, and put them on YouTube. It's been interesting to see YouTube during the pandemic. You know, We went from 500 subscribers at the start of the pandemic to now uh, 2,700 subscribers and, and about 100 new subscribers every month. Uh, we, we went from um, you know four hours watched per day per now, to now 20 hours watched per day. So I'm excited by online activities that are freely available to, to people all over the world. This is a poster for a uh, interview session, uh, interview series that we started. So we just did this interview with Catherine Hess and coming up we'll have interviews with Elizabeth Thadstrup and and Robert Adler, Shmuel Weinberger, Robert Greist, and others. All right, so <clears throat> here's sort of the um, uh, overview of my talk. Um, I'd like to begin with this picture. You know, this is a picture of a flock of birds. There's a whole bunch of geometric information here, right? If you have n birds, maybe n is a million, you have n choose two distances in this metric space of birds, right? And then if the birds are moving over time, you have n choose two distances that are changing over time. So it's a vast amount of geometric information. And I think it's not always easy to figure out how to vectorize geometry in order to use it as an input for machine learning algorithms. So if you wanted to predict, you know, is this a flock of one type of birds versus another? Or is this flock of birds going to move north next or south? you'd like to make geometry accessible to your machine learning algorithm. And, and there's many ways to do that, but persistent homology is um, sort of accidentally has grown into one way to vectorize geometry. So I'd like to describe how that works. I'll give an overview of, of some um, applications of persistent homology that measure global topology. And these are actually the older applications that gave birth to our field. And now, with uh, machine learning uh, being sort of united with applied topology, now I think persistent homology is much more used to measure local geometry um, in machine learning al applications. And that's, and that's really um, expanded the growth of our area. So persistent homology, sure, it's coming from topology, right? But it measures not only global topology, but also local geometry. And I think that's the main story behind some of its successes in machine learning. Okay, so we're actually done with the first section of the talk, how to vectorize geometry, you know, and choose two distances. It's hard to make that as a possible input for your machine learning algorithm. You know, even things like curvature, curvature is local. So if you have a space and you, you measure the curvature at each point, that's a lot of data to try to figure out how to feed in to your machine learning algorithm. Persistent homology is one way to vectorize geometry, which I'll introduce now. So a quick recap, you know, a geometer can clearly tell the difference between his coffee mug and his donut. You know, you have on the coffee mug, you have regions on the boundary of both positive and negative curvature, you know, that are different you know, than the, the curvature on the surface of the donut, or distances have been distorted in this transition from the coffee mug to the donut. But to a topologist, you know, these are the same space. You can continuously deform one to get the other. Topology is in some sense a little bit more computable just because the output of what you're trying to produce is simpler. You're not trying to describe the curvature at every single point. You're maybe just trying to give um, the homology group. So let's do homology with coefficients in a field. So then the homology groups are all vector spaces. 
and you can describe them up to isomorphism just with their ranks. So really you can think of homology with coefficients in the field as, as doing linear algebra. Zero dimensional homology is counting um, connected components. So I have six connected components here and that's why the, uh, the zero dimensional homology has rank six. Um, whereas in all these other spaces, they're connected. So the zero dimensional homology rank is one. One, dim one dimensional homology counts loops. So this space has three loops. And then on, on something like a sphere, well, any loop I draw can be shrunk down to a point. Um, so that's why it has no essential one dimensional loops. The sphere, however, has a void inside, so it has this two-dimensional hole. You could fill it with jelly, and the jelly doesn't spill out. Now, this hollow torus here is connected. It has two one-dimensional loops going around those two ways. And it also has a two-dimensional void. You could fill your donut with jelly, and the jelly won't spill out. And, and given a simplicial complex, you can really compute the homology quite quickly using linear algebra. Um, persistent homology makes homology sort of amenable to data. So let's start with a point cloud data set. Maybe it's a flock of birds, school of fish. What we'll do is we'll produce a growing sequence of simplicial complexes. So we'll have a scale parameter. Think of the scale as a, a measure of how much are you blurring your vision. And whenever data points are um, mutually within that si within that scale parameter from each other, you add in an edge. So if our scale is epsilon and these two data points are within epsilon, we add in an edge. And there's various rules for how you could add in the higher dimensional simplices, but one of the easiest ones is whenever all the edges of a simplex have appeared, throw in the higher dimensional simplex as well. And so you'll get tetrahedra that appear, et cetera. So we have an increasing sequence of spaces. We're growing the scale parameter. And whenever you have an increasing sequence of spaces, you can compute the persistent homology barcode, which tracks the homology groups as the scale changes. So at this scale, all we have are these individual connected components. And each zero dimensional bar just measures a connected component. So this is zero dimensional homology. Things start merging up. And by the time we get here, we just have one connected component measured by this one bar. All right. By the time we get to this scale, you can see we have one connected component, but we also have two one dimensional holes. So one of the one dimensional holes is pretty big and the other is quite small. And then as you increase the scale, one of those holes disappears and now only a single one dimensional hole remains. So functoriality is playing a big role here. We're not just tracking the homology groups at each scale. We're seeing how the various holes you know, map to each other as well. This now is measuring not only topology, but also geometry, right? We had the signature, this big hole corresponded to a longer bar, whereas this smaller hole corresponded to a shorter bar. And so maybe the, the old perspective was that short bars were less important. They might have corresponded to sampling noise whereas the longer bars corresponded to the true features of the data set. Machine learning has really changed our perspective on this. We now know that when you use persistent homology in machine learning algorithms, the machine learning algorithm uses the short bars just as much, if not more, as the large bars, long bars. It's a little bit, you know, think of a long bar like a trumpet solo, you know, piercing over the orchestra. You can hear it quite, quite clearly. Um, Whereas the short bars, it's like a single violin in, this, in the section of violinists. But together in concert, all of the strings together produce a powerful signal for, for machine learning algorithms. Questions so far? Let me go off on a little tangent here, uh, motivated by Min Young's talk in the last hour. So, <clears throat> In data analysis, you want a stability property. If you perturb your data set just a little bit, you want the, the output of your algorithm to change only a little bit. And that's true for persistent homology. So if I perturb the data set, you know, move points just a little bit, the bars will only move in a controllable way. You know, so this bar might get a little longer 
or other bars might get a little shorter. And, and you can make this precise. Um, the bottleneck or edit distance between the persistent homology of two point clouds, X and Y, is bounded from above by twice the gromov hausdorff distance between the point clouds. Okay, so maybe you've heard of the gromov hausdorff distance. It's a, it's a notion of distance between metric spaces. So close metric spaces are going to have close persistent homology. Um, why did I want to mention this? What's interesting is that um, persistent homology is, well, for one, it can accept point clouds as input, not just simplicial complexes. But, but also, um, it produces topological invariants that are sort of continuous in nature, right? You could have any real number as the bottleneck distance between two persistent homology barcodes, right? I could, I could change this bar by extending it by epsilon or two epsilon or three epsilon. So you get these continuous outputs. And so my, my question related to Min Young's talk, when you're trying to learn things like the Euler characteristic or homology, I'm curious if sometimes incorporating persistent homology into those algorithms might be beneficial because it gives you more continuous topological invariance. So you could sort of do gradient descent more easily, say with respect to a persistent homology barcode. Oh, I want this bar to get shorter or longer as compared to maybe it's a little bit harder to do, to do gradient descent on, on parameters trying to learn um, discrete outputs. But let's let's add um, an open problem to Min Young's list. Min Young talked about how do you uh, teach a machine to learn whether a simplicial complex is a sphere or what its homology is or what its Euler characteristic is. If you're given an increasing sequence of simplicial complexes, how well can a machine learn the persistent homology? Right. So, you know, the algorithms are at most cubic when you hard code the algorithm. But in practice, it gets quite hard. So people would like to compute persistent spar codes in situations where right now it's computationally infeasible. Um, so that's one problem. Increasing sequence, say, of simplicial complexes. How well can a machine um, learn the persistent homology? And then another class of problems would be starting with a point cloud data set instead of a simplicial complex. Right? So sample a point cloud from a sphere sample a point cloud from a torus, sample a point cloud from a Klein bottle in four dimensional space. Now your input is not a simplicial complex, it's the point cloud. How well can you identify, ah, this uh, point cloud was sampled from a sphere or a torus? And, and that was really some of the motivation for persistent homology. There's quite uh, rigorous guarantees that if you have a nice enough sample from a manifold, and if you compute the persistent homology of that sample, and if you ignore some of the short bars and pay attention to the long bars, then the long bars give you the homology of the underlying shape from which you were sampled. You, you could see that here. You know, maybe this point cloud was sampled from an annulus, right? And we sampled these points. We drew the persistent homology, and there are theoretical guarantees. Look in this region of the persistence barcode to say, ah, our shape from which we sampled had one connected component and a single one-dimensional loop. But, but those theoretical guarantees right, are so stringent that in practice, your sampling is often not good enough. Um, and so I, I think the machine learning question is, is a great one because mathematically, we can't prove that such algorithms will, will work in situations in which they do. Comments or questions on on any of that? All right. I mentioned you can run persistent homology on any increasing sequence of topological spaces. So let me give you another example. Another example is when you have a real valued function on some domain. Maybe it's a grayscale image and you consider the color as the um, intensity or the, the height of that function. Um, how do we produce an increasing sequence of, of spaces from a real valued function? Well, look at the sublevel sets underneath your function at some height. So you sort of cut your function at a height and you get the sublevel set. And now increase that height. Whoops. So as we raise the height, our sublevel set gets bigger and bigger 
and bigger. So that's our increasing sequence of spaces and we can compute the persistent homology. So the persistent homology is on the right where the connected components are in red, the one dimensional loops are in blue. And right now we just have a connected component, still just a connected component, but you'll see now we have a one dimensional hole and we can raise the level, we get an extra connected component, et cetera. So we're measuring not only sort of topological properties of this function, but also geometry properties of this function as well. You know, how long does a, a new local minimum last before it joins in with the, the rest of the sublevel set? There are two equivalent representations of persistent homology, either as a barcode or as a diagram. What I'm going to do for you now is explain how you produce the, the diagram for one dimensional persistent homology from this barcode. So each, each interval has a birth and a death. And it, you could take that interval and you can plot it as a point in the plane with coordinates, birth, and death. And here I have another interval with maybe birth time d prime, death time d prime, and you can plot that in the plane as well. All right. So you can almost think of taking your interval and laying it down like this, laying it vertically. So the height of a persistence diagram point above this diagonal is, uh, is the same as the length of the interval. And all of the points have to live above the diagonal because the intervals are always um, dying after they're born. So we'll see a lot of pictures of points and persistence diagrams. Points high above the diagonal are long bars that lasted over a range of scales and points near the diagonal are short bars. So humans are better at sort of interpreting these points far from the diagonal but machine learning algorithms use this local geometry structure of the points near the diagonal quite a bit. One example of this on a real data set. So this is a data set sampled from a brain artery tree um, and it's a tree. So there's, there's no global topology that's all that interesting, but the, the tree is embedded in three dimensional space in a way that, you know, the arteries, you know, are, are wrapped around each other and, and there's a lot of torsion and curvature and twisting and warping. And so what you can do is, is you could look at the brain of a 24 year old versus a 60 year old. And, and sadly, as I age, my, my arteries sort of <laughs> recede and decay a little bit and I have less local geometry. And if you, if you take this data set and you, and you grow it, we add in edges and, and triangles, et cetera, you can compute the zero and the one dimensional persistent homology. And in a young 24 year old brain, you have many points near the diagonal, whereas for the older brain, you have fewer points. And, and same for one dimensional holes as well. So many more local features appear. And um, in this way, we're making the geometry accessible to a machine learning algorithm who can quite, act, uh, quite accurately identify or predict the age of a brain from this geometry. Okay, so let me go back in time, say to the early early 2000s, or maybe the first decade of applied topology, and talk about some of the most famous applications where persistent homology was used to measure global topology. And then I'll contrast this with how it's now often being used to measure local geometry. So one of my favorite data sets in the world is um, this data set of a cyclooctane molecule. So a cyclooctane molecule has eight carbons arranged in the shape of a ring, and, and um, uh, each carbon also has two hydrogens sticking off of it. And that fixes the angle of these bonds between adjacent carbons, the hydrogens do, because this is the tetrahedral angle. So in any case, this, this molecule can uh, bend and stretch in various ways, even though these angles are fixed and the bond lengths are essentially fixed. You can do a degree of freedom count to figure out it should be a two-dimensional um, shape of configurations, but it's not clear what the shape is. So in this picture of the data set, each point is a confirmation and nearby points are nearby confirmations. 
What the actual space of configurations is, is it's a sphere with a Klein bottle glued inside. So it's, it's not a manifold. Um, but you can use persistent homology to um, not to tell you that it's a sphere with a Klein bottle, but to get you the homology groups. So from this data set sampling, uh, compute persistent homology, and the long bars correspond to the homology signature of a sphere with a Klein bottle glued inside. So it doesn't tell you the, the model exactly, but it gives you lots of clues about the homology of the model. Another beautiful data set is obtained by taking a digital camera and taking a lot of pictures of our natural world. It could be uh, scenes of trees or perhaps buildings. And then selecting out only three by three patches. Okay. And then normalization is done in these patches so that they all have the, the same average intensity, the same average contrast. And then you can ask yourself, what are the most common three by three patches? I should say low contrast patches, which are all the same color, like a picture of the sky, are thrown out. So we're only looking at high contrast patches where there's some variation in, in the image. Well, the most common patches live on this circle, and the circle is linear gradients at all angles. And then the next most common patches live on this three circle model, it turns out, where you get quadratic gradients appearing in the preferred horizontal and, and, uh, and vertical directions. And then in some sense, if you um, follow this model even further, you get a Klein bottle model for the space of the most common high contrast patches. So again, this is a very pretty shape, a Klein bottle appearing in a data set. Most data sets don't have Klein bottles. Um, and this is sort of how persistent homology um, became popular and, and inspired people to look at it at first. But persistent homology is now being used in many, many local situations where there's no Klein bottles hitting, hidden in this flock of birds. So let me start with some material science applications. Um, so there are many different types of glass and, and you can think of a glass as um, sometimes a solid, sometimes a liquid, sometimes in between, but we'll store this glass as a point cloud, the locations of all the various atoms in the glass and different types of um, near lattice type structures might emerge. But from a glass, you can produce a persistent homology signature. You know, take a, a chunk of glass and treat each point, each atom as a point, and then do persistent homology on this point cloud. And you get these, these local geometry signatures of what are the, you know, the sizes and the shapes of the features that appear. And from these signatures, you can, you know, you can try to do machine learning tasks. What type of glass is this? Or what's this glass going to do next? How quickly is it going to, you know, um, shrink down according to gravity and, and get thicker at the bottom than at the top? Now, this has been done on real glasses, but, but this next example is a synthetic data set. So these synthetic glasses were produced or synthetic materials were produced according to two different models, okay, the blue model and the red model. And you can measure the geometry of any such glass using persistent homology, any such material. Now, when you do this machine learning task of distinguish the blue class from the red class, you can produce a plot in the persistence diagram in terms of which type of holes were discriminative for each class. So we're sort of um, doing explainable machine learning in some sense. Yeah. Um, so what types of one dimensional holes are discriminative for this red class? Well, one dimensional holes that are born here, they're a little bit larger. They were born later and they died a little bit later than the holes that are discriminative for the blue class, okay? And so now you can go back and you can look at a material, this particular sample, which is from the blue class, but you can say, ah, these holes, as I increase my space, were discriminative of it indeed being from the blue class. And, and these holes right here, 
made me think that maybe it was from the red class. OK, and so you can go back and you can say, well, this is why I made the prediction that I made. In terms of the geometry, you can try to isolate the geometry that led to one prediction versus another. So um, I think I think uh, applications along these lines will continue to grow. We're using persistent homology not only to um, give geometry into the machine learning algorithm as input, but also to ask the machine learning algorithm as output, what is the geometry that you used to make one guess or one prediction versus the other? This is an inaccurate plot of maybe how some uh, machine learning models are uh, have this trade-off versus trade-off between accuracy and interpretability. So, you know, linear regression, k nearest neighbors, support vector machines, I think of as, as quite interpretable. And most of my work has been in this area. But folks have definitely done a lot of great work recently on, on taking persistent homology and feeding it in as a layer to a deep, deep learning model. All right, let me give one more application of um, interpretability when measuring local geometry. So this is the um, easing model, a statistical physics model. You have different temperature regimes and you sort of might have phase transitions you know, as the temperature um, increases. So the, the point cloud here is the points with positive spin you know, and the mitted points are the points with negative spin. All right, so take a simulation from the low temperature regime. You know, we have this point cloud, compute persistent homology. Um, um, and same for the high temperature regime. All right, so um, in a moment, I'll explain this transition from the persistence diagram to a persistence image, which is one thing I have worked on, but essentially to to produce a persistence image from a persistence diagram, you center a Gaussian around each data point. And you sometimes do this change of coordinates where the depth value is replaced with a persistence value. So this diagonal moves uh, to this horizontal line. In any case, um, in the high temperature regimes, we have more larger holes. And in the low temperature regime, we have more smaller holes. OK, and so we can we can um, back out this interpretation after this model has been trained. The model looked at points that were larger holes and thought of those as characteristic of the high temperature model, whereas these blue regions, in the persistence images image that were smaller holes were more characteristic of the lower temperature. All right. Now's a good chance for questions if there are any. Uh, I just have a question, but maybe at the end of the talk about your software you've developed, how it compares to, say, Ripser in C++ in terms of performance. And and yeah, you just can you tell us a bit more about your software, which is very interesting. Thanks. Oh, certainly, so yeah. So at, at the end of the talk. Oh, I'll say I'll say a couple words on that now. So you know, I'm I'm using a lot of software from others. Um, so um, I was involved in some early software packages, such as JavaPlex, that are now uh, largely way out of date. <laughs> And new oh, okay. software packages that's what have I want. emerged. Well, because I'm new to the field and I was sort of looking at it's very exciting. I just will, what software should I use if I want to run it? Yeah, yeah. Let, let me talk about this for two minutes. So if you shoot me an email, I have a link on my webpage with uh, um, links to all different types of software packages. So um, Goody and Ripser that you mentioned are two I would highly recommend. Goody is sponsored by decades long grants coming out of this scoop from France. So a lot of academic software like this, the um, JavaPlex that I was involved on 
supported for a while, and then it's no longer maintained. Goody has has long consistent funding, so great tutorials. And Goody can really do everything: Viator strips, persistent homology, sublevel set persistent homology, um, and it's fantastically documented and with tutorials. Ripser can do fewer things, namely Viator strips complexes, but extremely fast. Yeah. Um, there's now a package Scikit. There's now a package Scikit TDA that. Um, integrates a lot of these software persistent homology packages with uh, classic machine learning algorithms too. Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, so, sorry for interrupting you. Um, I just, maybe in your experience, can, can you sort of feel if GPU can give a good acceleration? Because I, it looks like Rips are sort of bets on that, but are those algorithms are good fit for GPU or, or not? I know of, um, a little bit along this line. So there's a paper, uh, Ripser plus plus, on a GPU implementation of Ripser. And um, I'm speaking later this week on the problem of computing uh, Viator strips, simplicial complexes of, of um, hypercubes, and what are the homotopy types that come out. And um, we ran, I asked uh, Simon Zhang, who's one of the authors on uh, Ripser++, this GPU version of Ripser, to do some computations. And he was able to go slightly farther than Ripser was in terms of um, uh, computing persistent homology of, of these hypercube graphs. Yeah. So in terms of performance, you mean? So if he was able to be yep. can, can, can I... performance on the GPU, then that was... that's right. I think memory is one of the big problems in computing these Viator ships complexes. And they're yeah, really and it also, the, also the, the, the fact that you can sort of express your computations in a, in a sort of dense array and super parallelizable. <laughs> Without sort of sparse accessing to the memory, uh, right? So if, if I guess you have experience implementing those type of things, with, a, with those type of. I'm yeah. I'm now much less on the software side, but I can. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Great, great. Long question. Hey, hello. Um, oh, hey, not young, but somebody else. Please go ahead. Yeah, I just uh, wanted to continue with this uh, computational thing. Uh, nowadays, there is another package, Vo2, and it's much, much, much faster than even Rips and Plus Plus. That's my experience. I don't know how it, is, how and why it is fast. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate that. Appreciate that a lot. So I want to give a couple comments on on how to feed a persistence diagram into machine learning algorithm. And it's a little bit more complicated than one might think. And there's a lot of um, current and ongoing work on this. So what are some of the difficulties? Well, if I have a persistence diagram, let me let me draw it. You know, I have these birth times and death times. Okay. So the first birth and the first death, second birth and the second death, third birth and the third death. Okay. So I could vectorize this as a single vector. That I feed into my machine learning algorithm. OK, of course, one complication arises. If I add a new point, then my vector changes length. And that's not always the easiest to deal with. Another problem is that as points move towards the diagonal, this is signifying that the interval is shrinking and then the point moves towards the diagonal and disappears. So at some point, so in some sense, a point near the diagonal is close to a non-existent point. Um, let me describe another problem. Another problem is that the, the geometry in the space of persistence diagrams is a little bit um, uh, difficult. Even to do simple things like statistical averaging is hard. So let's say I have two persistence diagrams, the red persistence diagram and the blue persistence diagram. What is their average? Well, there's two possible answers. The, the green diagram could be the average of the red and blue, or the purple diagram with X's could be the average of the red and the blue, right? We're in this negatively curved space where there's not unique averages. So what this has meant is that people have, have tried to learn new ways to vectorize persistence diagrams. 
maybe map them into Euclidean space or a Hilbert space where you've entered products that make uh, more machine learning tools available at your disposal. Um, so one of these I'd like to mention is Persistence Landscapes, developed by Peter Bubenik. What you do is you take your persistence diagram and then you rotate it 45 degrees. All right, so these, um, these persistence diagram points now cast shadows. You could think of this as a mountain range. Okay. And then what you do to produce the persistence landscape is first you pull off the back silhouette, and that's your first function. Okay. So remove these mountains from the landscape and then pull off the silhouette that remains. And that's your second function. So the persistence landscape is a sequence of functions. You know, here's the first silhouette, the next remaining silhouette, et cetera. And functions, you know, are, are easily discretizable. And so, um, you know, you can discretize these functions and now do machine learning on them. Another relatively popular technique that, that I was fortunate to be involved on with my uh, collaborators from Colorado State is uh, persistence images that I alluded to before. So what we do here is we, we change coordinates in a very minor way. We change from death to persistence, which is death minus birth. So this diagonal line gets moved down here. And then we put a Gaussian over each point, okay? And then we produce a surface, which is the sum of Gaussians. And then you can discretize that surface into an image. Right? And so now you vectorize things. You're in a Euclidean space. You can take averages of persistence images, things like that. So a lot of these um, algorithms that are learning what are the most discriminative portions of the persistence diagram for one class versus another are heavily using one of these vectorization techniques like persistence landscapes or persistence images, for example. Okay, I want to give some more examples of cool types of data where you can measure local geometry using persistent homology and, and use this in machine learning tasks. So ion bombardment of a material will form these near hexagonal grids and the closer it is to being hexagonal, the better, because then it has better properties for use in a, in a battery. Um, how do you measure this local geometry of, of how close am I to a hexagonal grid? Well, you can treat these local maxima, you know, um, as, as points. And then you can compute the persistent homology of this point cloud. And in a perfectly hexagonal grid, you'll have extreme regularity in your persistence bars, right? All the bars will have the same length. Whereas if you have defects, the, the, um, the geometry of the defects will be measured in the varying lengths of the bars that get produced. So, so these types of measures do better oftentimes than, than what a material scientist might come up with um, by hand, which is maybe to count the degree of each vertex you know, and count the number of vertices with the degree six, which is most of them, or the defects, which have degree um, five or seven. So persistent homology is not a bad out of the box way to produce some signature of, of local geometry as compared with counting things like degrees and, and trying to choose that feature yourself. Folks have used persistent homology in collective motion models. So this is a Desornia model for a school of fish or a flock of birds. And um, uh, for example, one paper looked at aphids moving on leaves, and they wanted to test the null hypothesis that the aphids moved independently of their neighbors versus rejecting the null hypothesis to say that an aphid's motion depends on the, uh, the its nearby neighbors. And they were able to sort of produce persistent homology-based signatures and reject that null hypothesis, you know, to uh, sort of argue that an aphid's motion depends on where are the nearby aphids that it sees. Um, you know, here we have images of clouds. You could think of these grayscale images as a real valued function and then do sublevel set persistence to measure the local geometry of these clouds, you know, a convective cloud with all this bubbling. 
might have more features in its persistent homology barcode than a non-convective cloud that doesn't have this bubbling and instead sort of moves as it's blown in by the wind. Um, people have used sublevels of persistence to study a uh, really Bernard convection. So these are two materials that you know um, mix when, when they're heated. Okay. So I think I want to end with measure with mentioning some um, nice pure mathematics that has come out of this interaction. Okay. So remember, we started <laughs> using persistent homology largely to find beautiful shapes like Klein bottle bottles, global shapes and data sets. Machine learning entered and sort of surprised us by showing us that the short bars also matter and that um, machine learning uh, algorithms using persistent homology did well in part because they were learning based on the short bars. So folks have now gone back and, and studied the theory of this. Does persistent homology in a theoretical sense measure local geometry? And I can give you two positive theoretical results along these lines. So this is work coming out of the University of Florida. They sampled points at random from disks of various curvature. So the flat disk versus the, the negatively curved disk or a positively curved disk, say on a sphere. And you're only sampling points from a disk, not from the entire sphere. Then compute the persistent homology of these points, and you can use that persistent homology theoretically to recover the, um, the curvature of the disk from which you are sampling. So I like this. It's showing that our intuition that um, machine learning algorithms are using local geometry measured by persistent homology is a little bit backed up by theory. You know, you can detect the curvature theoretically using persistent homology. Another example is a project I worked on with folks out of Colorado State uh, using persistent homology to measure local geometry. So sample points at random from a Cantor set or a Sapinski triangle. Can you measure the fractal dimension of that shape? And you can. You sort of take a scaling limit as you sample more and more points and look at how the bars um, scale as you do this. Why might you think this is possible? So um, is the lengths of the zero dimensional bar are nothing other than the lengths of um, the edges in a minimal spanning tree. OK, so as I sample more and more points, the edge lengths in my minimal spanning tree are going to get shorter. Um, and that's these edge lengths in the minimal spanning tree are no different than the the lengths of the zero dimensional persistent homology intervals. So you can look at the scaling as you sample more and more points, the scaling, how quickly do those edges shrink to zero to uh, to recover the the, the 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 fractal geometry. But now you can define not only zero dimensional notions of fractal geometry, fractal dimension, but also you could measure you could define a one dimensional persistent homology fractal dimension or a two dimensional persistent homology fractal dimension, as we've done. All right. So I think I'll, I'll end there to leave time for questions. But in summary, I think it's a, a quite attractive problem. How do you vectorize geometry for use in machine learning? Persistent homology is only one such way to do so. Persistent homology in, was invented largely to measure global topology. But machine learning has surprised us, and we we now uh, are starting to understand better that it's the local geometry measured by persistent homology that's being used all the time in machine learning applications. So, thank you for your time and and questions, and I'm happy to ask questions now to to take questions now or to uh, take questions by email um, afterwards as well.